Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, apologies in advance if I make less sense than normal. I'm a little bit sick today, but we'll get through it. Um, I was interested when the organizers of the conference asked me to, to suggest a talk for consideration, because uh, we've been talking more and more about Julia in my field, and we're wondering whether, it's, whether we should push the students into using it or not. And so they asked me to come here and give a talk about Julia for, as an introductory level. And I was very curious to see who would show up for the talk, if, if indeed anyone, especially on a Saturday morning. So uh, just a little bit of background so that you know whether you should pay attention to my opinions on this or not, given your own backgrounds. Um, I have actually been programming since the 80s. I've been using the web or I've been using the internet since before the web started. Um, I've been involved in a lot of open source projects using Linux kernels since like 93, 94 type time. So I have a long background in this kind of area and I'm a bit of an early adopter. So I think we should make that clear that this is early adoption type stuff. Um, I work here in Berlin as a computational neuroscientist. And this field involves a lot of diverse skills. So you need to be able to develop models very quickly. You're trying to figure things out, whether you're playing with data or making a model to, to explain a biological system. You want it to be incorporated very quickly and you want to try out ideas very quickly. But at the same time, you have a problem that everything in the brain just scales massively. So if your problem looks promising, if your idea looks promising, then you need in some way to scale up your code massively and you need to do these massive, massive simulations at some point. Um, in addition to that, um, the, there's an error, a, a question of numerical reliability of your calculations. So up until a few years ago, many people in our field used MATLAB. Then there was a change to Python with, with a sort of a new generation of scientists in the field. Um, we held off from Python for a long time because of questions about numerical reliability and, and stuff of the language. But ultimately, NumPy was just too tempting, and so everyone, everyone got on board eventually. Uh, the problem there, though, is, is about the scalability, and we'll come back to that. Uh, when I worked a couple of years ago on my PhD, just to give you an idea of the scale, I, I was simulating typically um, systems with 10,000 neurons and 5 million synapses. And each of these things, neurons and synapses, are represented by differential equations. And so you need to solve this differential equation on every single time step of your simulation. So that's like 5 million um, differential equations every time step. So this is massive scale. And I know that the code I wrote at the time, so I started in Python, and then I had to at some point translate it to OpenCL to run on a GPU. And this, uh, this code scaled easily to 100,000 neurons and 500 million synapses. And we, we haven't pushed it beyond that. We didn't, we didn't see the need. But it's just to, to give you an idea of this, the scale here. But we always want the, the precision. So when you're doing this many calculations, if there's like a minor problem in your code where you're not quite, you're rounding a little bit incorrectly, this is going to scale up and up and up over repetitions. If you do the same thing 100,000 times or, or 10 to the 9 times or 10 to the 12 times, you're going to see a very huge divergence in the outcome eventually. And this is a huge problem in numerical computing. And so this is something that we all are probably aware of in this room, but you have to be very careful of. Um, I started using Julia two years ago. I'm a user. I'm not a core developer. I'm here to talk from a user's perspective. And just for, for this particular audience, I teach actually the advanced uh, scientific computing course using Python at both the Humboldt and uh, technical universities. So I do have some qualifications in the field of Python as well. <laughs> so Julia is a, um, it's an interpreted language. It was um, invented, I think in uh, 2009, the guys got together writing it first. And the first uh, official release was in 2012. So this was version 0.1 that went up on GitHub. Uh, so that's very, very new. It's produced by a group at MIT. And they have a rather long history of developing tools on, they were paid on DARPA contracts, on, on various uh, Department of Energy contracts in the US to develop tools to allow numerical programming to scale up. And so the idea was to retrofit things like parallelization onto existing languages at the time. And they had some success, but they also thought to themselves, yeah, but this is not quite the right way to do it, and we, and we need to think about this some more. It is, this is important, it's a general purpose programming language like Python, so you can do anything in it, but the numerical computing is at its core. In general, data scientists, uh, people who do numerical computing where performance is an issue should be interested in Julia. 
Compared to MATLAB, which would be one of the big competitors, it's so many orders of magnitude faster at this point. Um, if you're a Python user and you're already pushing the bounds of Python using Cython, it's probably of interest to you. And for me personally, it's this fast route from prototyping to high, high performance implementation that was particularly attractive. And also, I mean, I, I did say I am an early adopter, so if you want a new toy to play with, it is also interesting from that point of view. For this particular audience, I think it's important to note that syntactically, it's very easy to learn from Python. So the syntax is quite similar. I have to admit, I would say the same thing to a MATLAB audience. So the numerical processing, the, the equation writing is closer to MATLAB in some ways, but the programming side is closer to Python in, in look and feel. Uh, so it should be quite learnable for, for most of you. The big convincer for me was that you can use all your existing Python libraries in it. So there's a, there, there's a library called PyCall, and it's just a single command, and then you can call any of your Python libraries. I don't think I would have made the jump without that, because it allows you to learn the new language while maintaining your existing tools. So I, I personally, I found that very important. The development cycle is pretty similar to Python in terms of how you interact with it. I'll, I'll show you some examples in a few minutes, but in terms of what type of editor you use to write your code, this is not something on the, on the level of complexity of C or Java. It's much more interactive like Python. Um, the absolutely astonishing thing is that it runs at C-like speeds. It, it really, really runs as fast as C for most situations, which is really incredible. And then for me, again, personally, because I like uh, parallelization, I do problems that benefit from parallelization. It's built into the core of the language. Um, I don't have any good examples of that for you today, but it's really, it's in there in the design of the language, which is very important, rather than as a retrofit or as a library add-on. So I'm just going to give you an overview of from a programmer's point of view, from an abstract point of view of the language, and then I'm going to switch to actually how, how you run it, and I've got a, an IPython-type notebook to, to show you some, some example cases and how the, how the language works and that. So these guys sat down and they decided we're going to develop a new language. They said, we've got these huge numerical problems, and we want to, we want to get it accurate, and we want it to be scalable. And then there were some other things which came into play. So one thing is that I suspect most of the people at this conference are doing the kind of development where it's highly interactive. This is a data conference, so a lot of you are, are dealing with data, and so you want to load the data into something like a data frame, a panda, and you want to play with it, and you're not entirely sure what the results are going to be until you've finished your analysis, at which point you do not typically write an application to redo the analysis. You've finished it at that point. Um, so unless you're developing applications, a lot of the development nowadays is, is interactive. And so you've got some kind of um, read, eval, print loop where you're typing stuff in or you're copying and pasting it in or, or you're importing it. And you, you try out your code and then you make some modifications and you try it again. This is a very, very different development style from hardcore software engineering where you plan it out for weeks and then you write it for months and then you finally try it, bearing in mind that they do do testing along the way. Um, they tried to learn from existing languages. So Python was revolutionary when it came, around, came along, and it still changes the way we, we compute today. Um, so Python showed us, it was one of the first languages which really showed us that dynamically typed interpreted languages can be extremely useful in your day-to-day -day computing, and also it can scale up to making full-blown full applications. So, I mean, Red Hat really transformed the scene when they started using Python for all of the scripting in, the, in Red Hat Linux, whatever it is, 15 years ago or so. And this really showed us that, hey, you know, it doesn't have to be as complicated as Perl or whatever, and yet it can do absolutely everything you want to do. And computers are finally powerful enough to use this interpreted language, and you don't have to worry about compiling it for five hours on one computer in order to run it on any computer. So this is really nice, and this is something that languages can certainly learn from nowadays. Uh, the other thing is that uh, rapid prototyping and a low barrier to entry are very important language characteristics nowadays. So we're, we're in a kind of a framework where people do agile programming and so on. They want to see their results quickly, and they don't want to spend a lot of time figuring out the minor nuances of the language. And whether you use a bit shift or whether you use some kind of other function, can you gain the last little nuance of, of speed out of your system? 
So they really just want to be able to sit down at the computer and address the problem you're thinking about rather than sitting down and saying, well, my programming language allows me to do X, Y, and Z. And then there's the final thing is what happens when you need to scale things up? So it's great having these, uh, these dynamically typed interpreted languages, but they don't always scale so well. So the typical solution is that you use two languages. And I've done this, many of my friends have done this. You write your code, your scientific type code in Python, MATLAB, Mathematica, or S++, uh, whatever you want. And you do your investigatory work and you do your prototype development in this language. You find that, yeah, we've got something that looks pretty interesting here. Now I'd really like to prove that it works, so I need to scale it up in some way. And you go back and you rewrite all of your code, or at least the important parts of it, in C, Fortran. In my case, I wrote on OpenCL. Um, some of the people in this room maybe are using Cython or something like that, in order to get the performance, which allows you to really, really scale up your code. Um, they, um, I don't remember what I was going to say about that, but <laughs> um, this is just a huge development overhead. Okay, what I was going to say is that there's only in large companies where this step is somewhat massaged, where you have engineers in the company who take the, the prototype code and they rewrite it for you. So I have friends in some of the bigger companies and they, you know, the kind of Google DeepMind and the type. And in these companies, it's true that they have an engineer who will rewrite the code, but this is extremely rare. And even then, there's a time overhead in all of this, that the engineer does not turn around and produce the C code the next day for you. It'll take him a few weeks or even a few months to rewrite it. Um, so time, time, time is an issue here. You've gone and you've spent all your time writing here, and then you need to translate it. So how is Julia a solution to all of this? So in technical terms, it's a dynamically typed language still like Python, but with optional types. And I'm going to go through each of these, uh, these points in turn just to, to define them. It's got built-in types that are equivalent to user-defined types, and I'll tell you why that's important. It's just in time compiled using the LLVM suite. It utilizes something that the developers effectively coined the phrase and, and called dynamical multiple dispatch, and this is where most of the speed comes from. It has full native programming capabilities, and you can call C and Fortran libraries natively, which is very important for some of the numerical computing. So what does it mean to say that it's a dynamical language with optional typing? So Python, as I said, is a, is a dynamically typed language. That means that types are interpreted at runtime, and they can change during the runtime of the, of the system. So your variable can change type while you're running the system. And so Python, the interpreter, needs to check from time to time to make sure that it's still the type that it thinks it was. And all of this checking is an overhead in the system at runtime. C, on the other hand, is statically typed, so it's fixed at compile time. Um, this is great because there's no more checking after that. Can, of course, lead to uh, various buffer overflows and stuff like that, but that's another issue. Um, but the, the real catch with the C one is that this needs to annotate the code really slows down the, the actual coding process. So you're writing C and you need to constantly think about your types. You're writing in Python, you don't need to think so much about your types. You sort of do need to know that you're running the right function on the right variable, but apart from that, it's hopefully taking, taking care of it for you. So you've got this speed trade off here with types. And in Julia, it's basically optional. The types are there under the hood, but you don't have to define them, and they can change dynamically at runtime. Um, what's interesting is that the use of these types is largely not required to obtain the performance boosts, so you don't need to go to the trouble of coding them in. Uh, so typically, you don't. It will help a little bit. In previous versions of the code of the, the system, it helped a lot more. Uh, but they've, they've optimized the, the compiler system now, and they've ironed out the bugs. And, and so it's, it's, much, uh, it's, it's very handy now, and it interprets the types correctly. And basically, you don't need to do as much type checking because of this th feature, which I'll mention in a couple of slides, called multiple dispatch. So at various parts of the code, the interpreter is better able to interpret what are to predict what the types will be, and then you need less checks. Um, 
So at that point, the types become important for basically saying which code gets called at which point by saying that, well, we're going to do an addition here on integers, or we're going to do something here on my super private new data type, which I've just invented. And you'll do, you'll do different operations depending on which one you're calling it on. Um, for like real language aficionados, I just have two very brief comments. One is that types are optional, as I said, but you can, it does the default type promotion, which happens in most languages. So if you add an integer and a float, you do still typically get a float. It's, it's reinterpreted as a float. So the integer gets promoted to a float before the addition happens. Most of your languages, including C, do this behind the scenes. What's interesting here is that you can redefine these types and you can extend them for these promotions and you can extend them for your own types. But that's only for the, the real um, people who are going to go really into the detail. Uh, the most important thing is that most of the core is written in Julia at this point. They originally started in C and other languages to bootstrap it, but at this point most of it's written in, in Julia, which means that they have a real incentive to make sure that the built-in language types have the same um, speed as the user-defined ones. Because if you start defining them in your Julia code and it's somehow slower, so most languages, if you define a type in, the, in, the, in yourself in the language, it's slower than an int or a float. Well, in this case, no, they have the same priority in the language and they're, it, it's, it's optimized for handling user-defined effectively. And since the native ones are effectively user-defined, they're all equal. LLVM is at the core of the language, uh, or sorry, at the LLVM is the, is the compiler effectively here. So it's a, co a compiler um, infrastructure project. Julia, what it does, and this is a great way to bootstrap a language, Julia uh, generates uh, intermediate representation code, and then LLVM takes it, it optimizes it, and then it compiles it for whatever, whatever the host system is. And LLVM has so many front ends and back ends at this point that you can, you can run it on so many systems. Then finally, the output, the compiled output, executes on the um, on the host system, and um, this process is extremely quick. LLVM was designed for runtime optimization of of code, actually, back when it started. And um, what I find nice is that it allows you to uh, dive down and look at the intermediate representation, so you can look, in fact, at the code that you've generated, and there are some tools for that, and you can see whether you're actually going to um, make a difference by changing. If I write A plus V versus A plus B plus C, what, what happens in the, in the intermediate representation, and you can see pretty quickly why one is faster than the other, or why a certain loop style might be faster. Okay, multiple dispatch. I don't want to go into too much detail, but it is the core feature of the language. The nicest description I found of it online was that it's overloaded functions with late binding. If you don't want to know about this, just don't listen for this one slide. Um, the basic cl uh, class-based object-oriented programming, uh, typically it's dynamic, so it's at runtime that it's interpreted, and it's single dispatch. So if you've got a variable A, depending on the class type of A, you get a different function call. So the function call is defined within the class. So at runtime, you figure out what A is, and after you know what A is, you know which function you're calling. Uh, in typical function overloading in, in languages like C, it's static multiple dispatch. So it's static because it's done at interpretation time, and um, it depends then on what the parameters here, which function gets called, so you can overload the function. It, it C basically does it that it's, it's dynamic, so it's at runtime, and it's depending on the types of all of the parameters. So every single parameter that you put in there, all of them are then checked to see what type they are, and the actual function implementation that gets called depends on what the types of those are. And that's actually where the speed comes from in the, si in the system. Because once you're within the function, the interpreter or the compiler knows what the data types are from the parameters that were passed to it, and it allows it to massively optimize for that. Um, Macros are a feature of the language. I, I called it metaprogramming. Uh, so this is, is a bit like decorators in Python. They'll allow automated uh, code generation, which is pretty nice. And it also allows for some kind of nice optimizations. So sometimes if you're solving uh, a function or whatever, it can be better to have the actual version of the function hard-coded. So like x squared plus x cubed and so on. You need to know these powers. 
it, this is faster than doing a general solution to the problem. And so by using macros rather than writing a generic function, this can be done as in, as, uh, at compile time, and then you get huge speed, speed ups. And finally, uh, I said that C and Fortran can be called natively. So most of you know that most of the numerical libraries are written in C and Fortran that we use today. This gives us huge speed and also reliability because they've been checked so many times. Uh, you call them using a function called ccall. Clock here is the function that's called. The return type is an int32, and there's no parameters passed in this example. Um, the just-in-time uh, generated instructions are identical to those produced by a C compiler. So there should be no overhead here in making this call. Um, if you're writing it for your own libraries, it has to be from a shared library. But the hard thing is that you're responsible for type compatibility. And I should also say that you don't have access to header files and stuff like that from this system. So it's only through the shared library interface. So it's a, it's a little bit more tricky. So now we're going to go quickly through um, an example of uh, some stuff of how to interact with the language. So you can download it here from julialang.org. The documentation is all online. A year ago, I spent a lot of time on the forums complaining about the quality, but it's really, really very good now. Um, the forum is extremely active with a, lot of, with a lot of users, so it's on Google Groups, and just look for Julia or Julia users. Um, there's four ways of interacting with the language. You can run it in the command line, you can use a REPL, you can use an IPython-like notebook, so Jupyter Notebooks, or you can run it in, uh, in Atom with a plugin called Juno. So I'll just I have some screenshots. So you can run it on the command line like Python, you run Julia and then the file name, and it does some kind of output for you. End of story. Uh, the read eval print loop, which many of you will be familiar with, you just type in your code, you run Julia, it's got a nice logo if you, if you run it like this, or you can disable that. Um, <laughs> Um, you type in your code, the thing runs, and this is actually my way of interacting with it most of the time. I can copy and paste my code into it, I can import code from a source file and it just loads it. So like the, the uh, what is that symbol, percent run symbol in, in um, IPython. <laughs> Jupyter Notebooks, which my example is in, um, it, it's called iJulia rather than iPython. And finally, this is going to be very nice, but it's not quite there yet, I would say. Previously, they were using Lighttable. Some of you might have heard of that as a new, uh, a new development environment. What's cool is that you run it here in the text editor, and these little tick marks mean that you ran that line of code. And when you run the line of code, it tells you what the output is. So this A rand 4x4 gives you a 4x4 array of float 64s, which is two-dimensional. And if you click on the little arrow thing beside it, you can actually see the elements of it. So it's very like some of the kind of Mathematica type interfaces, which I think is going to be very nice. You can print out the console down here. You can print your graph here. But I have to say, I, I played with it last week, and I was not overly enamored with it just yet. The light table implementation was beautiful, but they ran into some development hurdles with it. They've switched to Atom only a couple of months ago, and it's just not quite finished yet. But if you come to it in two or three months' time, it'll probably be working very well. Um, I put in a special slide for this before I show you the example. You can forget about indentation. This is a Python audience. You start things with words like function and if, and you end them with ends. And indentation is irrelevant here. It was beautiful, briefly, in Python. And I have to say, I got over it pretty quickly. I use IDEs and stuff, and I just... I want the code to be ind indented, by the way, but just for readability, not for... Uh, not for uh, use. So, okay, the example I have here, um, let's just clear these cells. Where we go? I'll output clear. Okay, so it's quite simple. I'm just like going to run through it, and we have five minutes left, so that's perfect. So you can declare a variable A and give it a value 10. Um, you can give a different one B and it's 15.3. Is this large enough or do I need to zoom it more? Uh, where, where is it? Okay, that's getting better. And I could also go full screen. So, um, it can do another variable, so you do a sum. We notice that that int, int float idea was not a problem here. Um, there are various simple mathematical functions like exponential built in. We can use functions like linspace to, uh, to initialize the variables. Um, we have functions like ones, which give you a, a vector of ones. 
and a random array of four by, uh, four by four random array where all of the elements here are random numbers. This is just to give you a quick example. I'm gonna put this online. Um, there should be nothing shocking here to anyone who does programming. So the first thing for this audience is that array indexing is from one and not from zero. So if I uh, do from zero, there's an error. Uh, the end of the array is addressed by end, and unfortunately the minus one indexing does not work. That was a bit of a shame. Uh, you can do various uh, skipping through the, the indexing. So this is like from one to end in steps of two of that A array. And we see that we get the first element followed by the, the third one here. And we go down in this way. We go the, to the third one here, 0.6 and 0.37, which is down here. Um, there are Boolean types. Obviously, like I said, the types are dynamic and I didn't have to tell it it was a Boolean. I can run a while loop based on that Boolean with various logic inside. So there's a while, there's a counter, plus equals works, which it doesn't in every language. Um, there's an if statement and so on. I can do this kind of indexing in, in, a, in a for loop. So for all of the elements in A works as well. And I just print them out here. Um, and I have a, a, so this is kind of MATLAB style, I would say this, this loop here for i is one to the length of d, so for all of the elements. I do some modular arithmetic here just for fun, but uh, I'm really just showing you that all of these language elements exist here. This is because, you know, you, you kind of wonder these things when you come to a new language. Um, so we can declare a function, which I called foo, and it prints out two things. It prints out a statement here and it prints out the argument value of the thing you pass to it. So a, a had value 18, and the type of A is int 64 on my machine. It could be int 32 on a different machine. Now, this is the first uh, example of um, multiple dispatch. I can write a version of foo which only accepts floats. And so this is the notation here. And I, it's actually the, the same function, or it's the same in, internal contents, but this one only accepts floats. And now I've got a function with two methods called foo. So there's an online help system like in IPython and so on. So you can just use the question mark. So for the print statement, it gives a nice output. For my foo command, it'll just give um, the example headers here for the, for the two. So there's a generic version and there's one specified for float 64. And so if I call it on A and B, so I call it on A, which had value 18 and it works. I call it on B. And it says, oh, that was a float, because actually I didn't realize I changed the text inside slightly. So it's the float version of the, of the function call, and we, we passed because we passed it a float. So this is a totally different function implementation here. Um, functions are passed by reference. So the calls are almost cost free, but it, there are some rules then about whether the variable gets changed once you're inside the function or not. So in general, it's supposed to not, but there are certain ways of addressing elements of, a, of an array where it does. So here I passed it the variable 18, it added uh, 45 to it, and in the function the value was 63, but when I come back out the value is still 18. Um, oops. D here was a, was a vector. Um, it gets modified in the function, but when you get out of the function, it's not. Now, if I change the addressing and I use this uh, element-wise addressing of the array, I can suddenly change the elements of, of an array-type variable. So here, I passed it this array or this vector. It gets changed in the function, and outside, the changes are maintained. So this is a way of accessing the, vari the variables in such a way that they get, uh, they get permanently changed. This is about mutability, basically. Uh, this worked because this was an array. And if I look here at this uh, type of the D variable and I write a new function bar, so I don't know if you noticed, the first one was bar and the second one was bar two. So now I'm, I'm going to overload bar effectively. And I'm going to give a specific version which only takes this data type. And all it's going to do is it's going to call bar two on that, on that, uh, data, on that uh, parameter. There's various functions like methods to see what the methods are. So bar now has two versions. Um, and bar two has just one, it takes any variable type. And now if I pass it that vector, we see that uh, we passed it this value, this vector here, it gets modified inside and the changes are maintained even though we call the bar function and not the bar two function. And if we do it with a, which was like a, an int, the uh, changes are not maintained. So that's important to note. So the 
last real thing I wanted to show you is that you can call Python libraries. So I'm using PyPlot here. There's a, an error because something is overloaded, but that's fine. And if I want to plot stuff, I have nothing pretty to plot. I'm just going to plot a sinus. And here it comes somewhere. There we go. So the, the plotting, so this is the full matplotlib. You have access to all of matplotlib in here. Um, and yeah, the only other thing I wanted to say is that uh, data frames exist in Julia. So you can use them like pandas, but I, I don't think I, like I don't have a nice example here. I just showed that I can read in some data and I and I plotted it. And you can you can vary use various functions to access the elements. But until you're actually using a data frame or whatever, it's kind of pointless. It's just to show that you can see that the variables have these names x1, x2, x3, and so on. So let me just switch back to my slides really briefly. So, um, Julia is working pretty well. There's 493 contributors to the core uh, as of this week. There's 966 registered packages. I knew people would want to see a benchmark at some point. So um, this is the benchmark that they, the guys who developed it publish. One here, or 10 to the zero, is C speed. So if you implement various functions in C, Julia is over here. It's clustered around C type speeds. Uh, Fortran is typically lower or faster than C, but with one outlier where it's slower. And uh, Python is this line over here. So it's, it's roughly one order of magnitude slower than C on, on most of these uh, kind of typical programming functions. Um, so just to summarize, Julia is quick to write. It's fast to run. It's a general purpose programming language. It's designed from the ground up for numerical computing with parallel processing and easy scalability and all of your existing Python tools should work with it. And so with that, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'd like to thank all of you for listening, for your time. And I'm really grateful to the guys who actually went to the trouble of writing Julia. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, David. I thought that was really interesting and I think we probably have time for one or two quick questions before we move on. Uh, thanks for the talk. Do you know whether there's a user group in Berlin? <laughs> sort of. I, I, I kind of half tentatively started one last year, but we, we only met once. <laughs> there are a number of us who use it, and we just haven't... Uh, I've been quite busy, and we haven't really gotten around to meeting again. But we are here. <laughs> when you say it has a data frame, does it have the same interface as the Python, the Pandas data frame? Or is it different? Um, it's different, but the guys who wrote it would have previously used Pandas, so there's huge overlap. Um, I would have to look up. I haven't used data frames with Julia, not, not for my own core research, so I can't, I can't say for certain. Okay, one more and then we move on. Uh, regarding um, sharing data frames between Python and Julia, because I, th I think today morning in the keynotes uh, um, it was shown how you could share data frames between mm. R and Python. Uh, yeah. Do you have any idea if it's also possible in Julia? Well, it's definitely possible. Yeah, you ha you have full access to the Python, so it, to any code you call. So you have you have access to all of the Python objects directly from Julia through the interface that they wrote. So yeah, it's completely possible. I don't. I don't use. I haven't used data frames in, in over two years. So it's. Uh, and that's how long I've been using Julia. <laughs> so. Okay. I would say thank you again, David. Thank you. Mm -hmm.